Welcome back to the CreateX stage where creativity meets technology at the COGX virtual festival for AI and breakthrough technologies. It's exciting to be part of the biggest, most inclusive and forward thinking gathering of leaders, CEOs, entrepreneurs, policymakers, artists, academics and activists of its kind. A special welcome to those of you who are coming to the CreateX stage for the first time. I'm Janet Hull and I represent the UK Creative Industries Council, a community of leaders who together seek to safeguard, support and promote the UK creative industries both around the UK and on the global stage. I'm your MC for CreateX and I'm here to help you navigate the spectacular three-day programme we've helped prepare for you. This is our first year at COGEX and our fourth year of running CreateX. We're delighted that although we're the newbies at COGEX, we're already the second most popular stage with over 1,800 registered to participate, 30% of them outside of the UK. The CreateX stage is hosted by the Creative Industries Council and supported by Facebook, UKRI, Moore, Kingston Smith and Digital Catapult. COGEX is all about community. And if the creative industries is the community you want to belong to, just email us at createch at thecreativeindustries.co.uk and we'll make sure to keep you involved. Please hashtag your appreciation of createch too using hashtag createch and CognitionX2020. The overall theme of COGEX this year is how do we get the next 10 years right? And for us in the UK creative industries, for this next session, this means how do we grow our businesses in this new world where creativity meets technology? It's been curated by Moore Kingston Smith, financial service advisors to create tech businesses. So it's particularly pertinent to any of you in create tech startups or scale ups who are looking for the next injection of capital to unlock potential for your business. A big welcome to Esther Carter, partner at Moore Kingston Smith, who will be moderating this session. Over to you, Esther. Thank you very much, Janet. Thank you very much. And investment landscape for create tech businesses. My name is Esther Carter and I'm a partner at Moore Kingston Smith, a top 20 firm of accountants and advisors with international reach in over 100 countries. And I work in one of our central London offices in the West End. Um, we've got over 100 people, all of which specialise in working with media business and creative technology businesses. Um, we offer compliance services such as accounts, tax, payroll and bookkeeping, as well as lots of advisory services as well, such as tax planning, research and development, valuations, employee incentive schemes, and also lots of strategic growth services. We've got a fantastic session lined up today um, on the funding landscape scope from startup to series A, and we're going to be discussing what funding is available, um, what investors are looking for, and how create tech businesses can really stand out from the crowd. So we'll start off um, by hearing from each of the panellists, and that will be followed by a panel discussion. Uh, there'll then be a chance to hear an interview with Ben Jeffries, the founder of Influencer, one of the Create Tech 100 ones to watch. And following that, around three o'clock, there'll be an open Q&A session where you can ask the panellists any questions that you have. So I'd like to introduce our panellists. So we have Mej Patrick, um, who is Creative England's Chief Financial and Operations Officer. And she oversees all investment activity for the company and has a real keen interest in growing its commercial activities and diversifying its income streams. Previously, Mej worked as Director of Finance for the United Nations Association and Stakeholder Forum. Secondly, we'll be hearing from Paul Winterflood, who's a director in the Moore King Smith Corporate Finance Team, specialising in the media and technology sectors. Um, Paul helps entrepreneurs grow and realise the value in their business, spending the majority of his time advising companies, raising growth capital or working with shareholders who are looking to sell. And finally, we'll be hearing from Hannah Williamson, who's an associate in the investment team at The Edge. Her role includes supporting the team with deal flow generation and assessment and particularly focusing on retail tech and content businesses. And prior to The Edge, um, Hannah worked in the online retail sector um, at ASOS for three years within the operational side of the business. 
So I'll hand over now to the panellists to tell us how they work with Create Tech businesses and, and also how coronavirus, um, this, this pandemic, is impacting the market. So firstly, over to you then, Mej, from Creative England. Can you tell us a bit about what Creative England do and how they work with early stage businesses? Definitely. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, thanks everyone for having me. It's great to be uh, speaking to you all uh, from this sort of very unusual, but our new normal way of reaching out uh, to, to the world from our own studies and our own homes. So great to be here. Um, before I sort of tell you a bit more about Creative England and the associated group of companies that we are and what we do, I really thought it's really important to acknowledge the, uh, the environment we are in and it will be remiss of me to not use this platform to acknowledge the Black Lives Matter campaign that is going on in full force outside and to uh, give my support to the cause and to say that um, we are sort of um, experiencing a very unusual moment in, in history and it is still to see whether the uh, sort of the the impact of that is uh, going to cause a long-term change or is it just a moment in history but I from our perspective wanted to say that from the creative community and from the investment community, we need to stand behind it and do whatever we can to support the cause and bring long-term change. So I just wanted to put that out there. Now I'm Medjubin Patrick and I am the Chief Financial Officer and Investment Lead at Creative England. Um, Creative England is actually uh, part of a group of companies. Uh, we are um, overall and um, called Creative Nation as an, as an umbrella organization. And we are uh, three uh, parts of the business, Creative England itself, um, Creative Growth Finance, which is our investment arm, and Creative Industries Federation, which is our membership arm. Uh, together, these three businesses um, are really here to support the creative um, industries in, 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 in England, in UK, really. And uh, we do that by um, not just sort of providing investment, which is why I'm here and which is what I'm going to talk about in more detail, but also by providing a platform for creative industries to um, you know, get their voice heard. We, through our advocacy and policy work, um, sort of bring all the stakeholders within the industry together and open up the conversation around what is important for creative industries and how what the role they play in making the uh, sort of UK a place to be and how the the government and all the other external stakeholder make that um, make that work for the industry um, through our membership work within creative industries federation we uh, bring uh, freelancers individuals micro businesses smes as well as big businesses corporates you know amazon bbc channel 4 facebook to the small one man band organizations and individuals uh, in uh, as a, uh, on our creative industries federation forum we bring education government and, and everybody else to really um, you know have a debate about creative industries and creative businesses and what what works and what doesn't um, on Creative England side, which is where the uh, you know our fund also sits, um, our, our job is really to support creative um, sector by providing hands-on support, and not just about advocacy and you know getting their voice heard, but actually putting in place practical solutions to the problems that creative industries are failing uh, are facing. Um, we believe that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. We believe that. UK is full of some excellent creative talent and there's huge potential um, that these creative industries have and through our work in Creative England we support that talent and we give them opportunities, we connect them to money, market, people, they need to grow. Um, our work is spread across the whole of whole of the country, um, but we really focus on areas outside London because we believe that there is, as I said, talent is everywhere and there are parts of UK which perhaps don't have access to opportunity as good as, you know, the centres like um, London or Manchester and other, other sort of, you know, hubs of creativity. So that's what, what we really do. We bring in um, paid... Um, mentorship, paid in support, um, workshops, uh, connections, profile that we, um, and so we help creative businesses as in any way we can through, through our work in Creative England. The third um, sort of track of our support is our investment activity. Uh, the, the, the products that we are really in the market um, 
for our is our creative growth finance, which is a new debt um, uh, debt product we have um, we have put out there for creative businesses. It's mainly uh, up to half a million of investment for creative uh, companies. Uh, these are companies who are um, really they're in that early stage of growth, who are looking for um, investment, but are actually not that keen to go for equity, but are, are but are still not um, experienced enough or um, sort of profitable enough for the banks or the traditional um, lending uh, lending lending services. Really, so we are really supporting creative businesses, mainly in TV, film, games, AR, VR, digital um, sort of um, tech businesses, and anything to do with, you know, creativity and tech and 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 screen and all of that sort of a whole, re, um, uh, whole sort of wide ranging businesses. Um, we are looking for businesses who are really ambitious about, uh, you know, making their, um, making a difference and making um, their mark on the creative industries within the UK and really contributing to the growth of the growth of the sector and also hoping to, you know, create new innovation and create jobs and, you know, put, put um, something back to, into the economy. Um, we uh, within our CG, within our investment activities, we have been uh, working on uh, sort of investing in equity investments in uh, in creative businesses as well, but also you know being very flexible in terms of what we can offer businesses, whether it is as I said a loan product or it is equity, but also we have some sort of visibility of grant funding and other sorry financial support that we can give businesses. Um, we believe that um, you know, as as Creative Growth Finance and as Creative England, become being part of the sector and being from within the sector, we really understand the create, create, understand creative businesses really well, and we are able to provide not just the money but all the wraparound support these creative businesses need um, to really grow. Um, I think um, I. I I'm sure that you're all aware of the the creative industries and and their sort of the, the size of it. But I thought it would be really useful to just uh, quote some of the numbers that we hear around, just to give you a context of how big the creative industries are and how big the opportunity is for for UK to sorry invest in in those businesses, but also for the investment community to take sort of you know advantage of the opportunities being offered. Um, creative industries are worth uh, 112 billion to the economy um, and they, they, that's what they contribute to the UK economy and they're bigger than automotive, um, life sciences and aerospace and oil and gas industries combined. So they are a huge contributor to, contributor to our economy. They provide one in eight jobs in, in the UK um, and they are growing at the rate of five, five times um, compared to the rest of the economy. Um, but but the more important thing in, in all of that is that creative industries are very much characterized by small and micro businesses. Um, they're 95% of the creative industries are micro and small businesses and 34% of um, uh, of the of the sort of people working in this industry are freelancers. So it's a very agile, very sort of flexible industry, but but being, you know, mainly small businesses, it does face a lot of problems as well. Um, and access to finance and actually reaching to the investor is one, one of those problems that they face as, uh, as a group of small businesses. And, you know, events like this and actually uh, sort of raising awareness of the opportunities within creative businesses really help to educate the investors and, um, and and sort of the community in general in, uh, in terms of the talent and opportunities that exist within creative sector. Um, and um, I think the uh, there, there's sort of a lot more we do and I would be very happy to answer any questions you have in, uh, in terms of what Creative England and its group of companies can do in helping creative businesses. But I just wanted to move on to the other part of the question that Esther asked and that, that is around how this current crisis we are all in 
the the lockdown, the COVID, and its fallout um, is impacting creative businesses. Um, as as you all know, the crisis ha is sort of um, totally agnostic. It is, it is affecting every walk of life, um, and and the economic fallout of this crisis is only just becoming evident. We know that this is not a crisis that is uh, that is going to go away with the health side of it being sorted out. Um, you know, when we come, even when we sort of start seeing things going back to some kind of normality, the economic impact of this is going to be a long term, um, long term thing to deal with. So creative industries, uh, businesses are impacted by COVID. And, um, and it is true that some part of the creative industry businesses are perhaps a bit more resilient and have found ways of sort of dealing with the crisis. But there are others that are um, impacted much more severely. Um, this is another factor within creative industries is that, you know, it is a huge big sector, but it is comprised of some very varied sectors, subsectors within it. So um, the, the games industry is on one side, which is sort of perhaps not as impacted by the crisis as much as uh, the theatre industries or the, um, the live performance in, uh, part of the part of the um, creative businesses. So uh, the impact of the crisis is on two sides. One is the businesses itself. We have um, in our portfolio seen uh, companies whose um, income has sort of disappeared overnight. As I said, the live uh, music or theatre or other small businesses in this space. So the businesses have to really, you know, um, work at the contingency planning and continuity planning in wake of the crisis and look at what they can sort of do to come you know to come to the other side still intact and alive so there's a big challenge that businesses are facing um we uh, within within our group of companies we have done a lot of research and a lot of surveys around how this um this crisis is impacting businesses and as i said um you know, theatre businesses and live music businesses and to some extent publishing and others are impacted quite widely. Um, but we have also seen um, some businesses really coming out with um, with sort of, you know, ways in which they can make some sense of the crisis and, and, and come out on the other side. Um, we have seen some good response from the games uh, space and we've seen some good re response from the sort of more technology uh, technology based businesses. Um, the other side of the uh, impact of the crisis is on the investment. So, as I said, creative industry businesses are small and they are uh, access to finance is a big challenge for them. It had it was a big challenge before the COVID crisis, and it has become more acute now. Um, investment uh, landscape overall um, is, is impacted by the uh, by the COVID crisis. We know that investors are becoming more. Um, Sort of cautious. Um, there is a defensive sort of mechanism creeping into um, into investors. Um, we know that you know fund fund holders and GPs they they are facing the crisis because they have to um, support their own portfolio companies and need to sort of make sure that the companies within their existing portfolios who are now facing crisis, they can help them with uh, follow on money or, or support them in any other way. But on the other side, those GPs are seeing that the investors are perhaps, you know, not, not, not so much forthcoming and the capital is constrained. Um, the, the other sort of uh, side of, um, of that sort of the impact on the investment landscape is that um, the, there's this cautious approach within investors is to wait and see how the lines of opportunities are redrawn. Um, we know that this crisis is going to throw up um, a lot of uh, sort of new um, sort of new uh, innovation and challenges. Um, and investors are being very careful as to see how where those sort of new opportunities are going to come from. So there is that approach of see the waiting and seeing where they, they would like to put money in. So there's impact on the access to finance, which is sort of exaggerated by the crisis. And there's, of course, the market itself, which is facing a huge upheaval. Um, and there are good stories, which, which I can cover at, at later part of the uh, part of the sort of uh, this this conversation. Um, but but just to say, I think um, 
uh, we, you know, there's a lot um, being done by the by the government in supporting creative businesses and supporting businesses in general. And but we all aware that is only so much um, that can be done, and and that money can only go so far. So there is, uh, it's you know, there has to be a um, sort of realization that industry needs to come together itself and create. The solutions and um, and opportunities that can help them come out of this crisis. Um, I think that is where I'm going to finish now. But I will come back with a few other thoughts and comments as we go through the session. Thanks, Mr. Min. Um, afternoon, everyone. Great to be here. Um, as Esther mentioned, I'm a director in the MKS corporate finance team, and I work exclusively with creative and technology companies, particularly advising businesses raising growth capital or looking to exit. Um, I've prepared a few slides um, around our, our growth capital report that our, our team, team produces. So as part of our work, our team produces a quarterly research into the UK growth capital market. So I thought it'd be useful to give a quick overview of our latest research to help, to help show the Createc uh, funding landscape. So every quarter we produce a report uh, which looks at UK private companies who have raised between £1 million and £20 million of growth, cap growth equity capital. Um, the numbers don't include senior debt and mezzanine debt fundraisers also, and also doesn't include smaller fundraisers um, unless more than a million pounds is raised. So startup funding here is generally um, not included as, as that tends to be significantly less than this amount. But, um, for a typical company, this will this this often captures a, a, a Series A round. We also publish a Createc version of the report, um, which analyzes the the transactions and trends in the Createc create sector. Um, next slide, please, Matt. So this next slide shows the key findings from our Q1 report from 2020. So the chart on the left shows that quarter one activity was around 20% down compared to the equivalent period last year, showing that the, the transaction numbers were start, very much starting to impact the market in, in quarter one, even though the UK didn't lock down until the, till pretty much the end of the quarter. More positively, the average deal size um, was around 5.15 million. Uh, and that's broadly consistent with the last two quarters of 20, 2019. And, and that's significantly better than all of 2018 and the first half of 2019, which shows that I think that shows that when when investors like the com uh, the company, uh, they're willing to they're willing to put increasing amounts of capital in, which is which is definitely positive. The chart on the right shows the number of Createc transactions as well as the percentage of Createc tra transactions in the uh, overall data. Uh, and this shows that in, in Q1, uh, this year, the, the Createc sector was outperforming the, the UK growth capital market as a whole, uh, despite the uncertainty, which is which is great news for the sector. Just in terms of the type of investor we're looking at here, um, of the 35 transactions um, recorded in the Createc sector in Q1, uh, around about two thirds were venture, venture capital investments and, and around 10% were angel investments. Just one transaction was a corporate investment um, which is which is much lower than the um, than the fintech sector, for instance. So I think this this very much demonstrates that for creative businesses, if you're looking to raise more than a million pounds, the key is to make sure that you're attractive to venture capital um, capital houses, which uh, which Hannah can tell you more about shortly. Next slide, please, Matt. So this next slide analyzes, analyzes the transactions pre and post the lockdown of the of the 23rd of March. So all the transactions in the year to date. So if we look at now, look at the overall transaction value uh, volumes. There's been there's been a 50% reduction in the market as a whole. Um, and that's from the conversations that we've been having with with the VC community. That's that's broadly consistent. I think uh, the the VC houses were very much focused on uh, their own portfolio immediately following lockdown. Um, before looking at looking at um, other other businesses and and additional and additional investments. 
any sort of conversations that the uh, that um that the venture capital houses were having with with businesses that want before c committing to an investment uh in, in this in this new new environment they wanted to make sure that the um that the, that the uh, data in the businesses is holding up and that the the metrics are, that the business is still performing well I think the the post lockdown numbers are probably still slightly uh, uh, slightly boosted by um, there being a number of deals in that, that where the majority of the work had been carried out pre lockdown. So it may not be ref completely reflective of, 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 of the fall in the market, uh, but it, it definitely gives a, a fair uh, a fair ref a reasonable uh, reasonable uh, reflection. Now moving to the create tech sector. Um, Again, this beat the market, which is great news. Um, even though even though deal volumes did fall, the proportion of deals um, increased from fifteen percent to twenty one percent. I think it demonstrates the resilience and the attractiveness of the sector to to investors. Average deal value did fall slightly in the creative sector in the creative sector. So possibly, uh, um, if the investments were a bit more speculative, the investors wanted to put a bit less in. Um, but I think the fact that investors are are still uh, investing in in the sector is a is a is a really good news story. Again, the majority of the deals were would be VC backed, um, and that that's very much the trend quarter on quarter. I think in terms of my my sort of forward looking view, I think the combination of the the high quality of the UK create creative and technology sectors, I think supported by the investor friendly environment. Can, Creates a powerful, powerful ecosystem. So I think that uh, create tech businesses that have that are trading trading well through the uh, through the crisis, whether that's content production, um, or video games. Um, I, I think um, that those sort of businesses that have got a strong proposition and strong data will continue to be invested in. As there's a lot of investors with uh, with with funds to deploy. So I th my view is I expect. The, the create tech sector will continue to beat the market, even if um, even if deal volumes are slightly lower than um, than in 2019. So that's it in terms of my um, in terms of my slides. Um, the, uh, if there's any further questions, and I think there's, there'll, there'll be some staged, um, there'll be some um, a, a, there'll be a few a few more questions in the panel discussion later, which which I will address. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, my name is Hannah Williamson. I work for Edge Investments and we are a creative economy specialist VC. Um, we're currently deploying a £40 million fund into growth stage businesses, typically with around a million pounds in existing revenues. Um, we usually invest between one and three million pounds in an initial check, but we can go up to five million. Um, we invest worldwide, but we usually look for businesses with a UK presence or head office. And obviously the creative economy um, is a big umbrella of subsectors. So to kind of put it into where we invest into kind of two buckets really so we invest in the first bucket being content creation businesses so whether it be books tv music or podcasts and then the second bucket is technology businesses so technology businesses which enable the monetization exploitation or distribution of content and IP. And um, so that gives you a kind of rough idea of, of, of what kind of businesses we're looking at. And to give you kind of a few examples of companies within our portfolio. So um, first example would be a million ads. Um, a million ads allows producers and creatives to quickly and intelligently personalize audio adverts. So what they do is they combine contextual information with um, an advertiser's message. So with that information might be the listener's name, the weather, the location, and that helps advertisers to create highly relevant and better performing ads. And since the technology is creating these variations, it's at 
a fraction of the cost. Um, another good example of a company in our portfolio to share with you is, is Newsflare. So Newsflare is a curator and a marketplace for user-generated content. So, for example, if you were to record on your mobile phone a video of your street out in force for, for carers, you could then upload that video um, to the Newsflare platform and they make that video available to buy and they sell that to global media companies. And if the video sells, you also get paid. So particularly in the current climate, Newsflare has benefited from the power of user generated content and it's allowed brands to be able to adapt to the lockdown by using real stories from real people in creative ways. Um, just to touch on why do we invest in the creative industries? Well, we believe that there are fantastic investment opportunities within the UK creative economy because of its unifying characteristics. For example, the opportunity to scale quickly. Digital and other technology advances means that instant global distribution at virtually zero marginal costs. Um, many businesses within the creative industry carry small or low inventory and it's a sector where relatively modest investments can make colossal returns. There's also a thriving M&A market so plenty of opportunities for exit and particularly in the current circumstances it shows resilience in a downturn and faster growth in the following upturn. And specifically within the UK, this is a sector where the UK culturally leads the world. So if you think from uh, James Bond, Dunkirk, Peaky Blinders to The Crown, Paul Smith to Alexander McQueen, British creativity is highly valued around the globe and the English language is a huge advantage. So just to touch on how we work with early stage businesses. So um, as a specialist investor, Edge has a unique overview of the creative sector, which allows us to offer insight, experience and relevant high level con contacts to the companies that we work with. Um, we only ever take minority stakes in companies, so we never seek to control the company, but we do usually get asked to take a board seat so that we can work with the founders to mentor them, give advice, you know, ranging from advice on the strategy of the company, setting KPIs or working with management on future fundraising proposals as, as a few examples. Um, we also look to provide our companies with useful introductions, be it introductions to new sales leads or advisors or other investors or potential acquirers. So we really do like to be an active investor and help to contribute towards the success of, of the company. Um, I'll move on now just to talk about kind of in terms of coronavirus and how it's impacted businesses in our portfolio and how, how we're helping them. So for us really, it, it's, it's a moment in, in time crisis and obviously first and foremost, ensuring the health and the safety of our team and our portfolio companies and their staff is the main priority and that kind of goes without saying. Um, secondly, from a business perspective, we provided support and advice on loan schemes such as C-bills and the Future Fund, and we've shared best practices across the portfolio. Um, a couple of businesses are doing well and a few are struggling. But ultimately, at the macro level, we believe that the UK economy is uniquely positioned to recover from the impact of the coronavirus. Um, we continue to see massive global demand for audio and visual content driven by the inherent creativity within the fabric of our culture. This can't be replaced elsewhere and the entrepreneurialism of the UK's creative economy founders mean that we will continue to see new companies formed, new ideas supported and growth will ultimately return. In terms of how it's impacted our decision um, making processes, well obviously it is a setback and we have to take it into account. 
But ultimately, as I say, we believe very much in the long term value of the creative economy and we are still very much actively seeking investment opportunities. Um, we have money in the bank left to invest. You know, I'm currently um, pursuing an investment at the moment. And if we don't end up completing on the deal, it, it, it won't be because of coronavirus. Um, so our door is very much open to founders. And so if you feel that you fit our investment remit and are looking to raise funds, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. So clearly lots of opportunities out there for creative technology businesses looking for investment or funds. Um, so just a couple of specifics then. So, I mean, Mej, what, when you're sort of looking to work with early stage companies, what is it particularly that you're on the lookout for and what, what would help an early stage company really stand out from the crowd? Yes, um, I think the um, it's sort of um, the usual stuff that a lot of investors look for. Of course, um, we are we are a fund. We are investing to uh, make returns back to the fund, so we can do more of this. So first and foremost, of course, the commerciality of an of an um, proposal, uh, the attractiveness of a business in terms of generating revenues and generating profitability. So that goes without saying. That is uh, something we we as an underlying fact we look for but other things we really look for in early stage businesses businesses are um, really the the passion of the team and the quality of the of the team really those are those are the foremost you know things that we are first of all get ourselves comfortable with we believe that you know a talented founder um, and a, a founder who has got passion for what they are doing they know what they're doing and and the founder uh, or founders who have surrounded themselves with the right sort of people you know uh, we, we are aware that an early stage business it's not always easy to sort of you know have a big paid team around you but but in uh, founders who are clever in sort of surrounding themselves with either sort of you know consultants or board members or whatever help they can get so we really look for that in a team that they have you know got that self, self sorted out and then we are also looking for um you know businesses who are coming with uh, opportunities in the sort of emerging uh markets or emerging sort of you know new uh, opportunities so um you know we absolutely look for businesses who are doing whatever you know the traditional creative industries or or existing um business models there are but if somebody is coming with a new idea with an innovation with with something to sort of you know i'll use the word disrupt uh, you know which is very uh, overly used but but if if somebody's coming with with a new idea which really we as the specialist creative industries investor can actually see the um, sort of value of then we'll go for that because that's what distinguished us and and as Hannah said, the, uh, us as creative industries investor, that we can we can see an idea and we can sort of see whether it will work or not. So we're looking looking at that, and then the, the you know the the usual stuff, the technology behind the proposal, the size size of the market, all of those things that all the investors look for. But it's the it's the people um, the for and for the, the most important thing for us too when we are looking at a creative business. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Mej. Um, Paul, um, what sort of tax advantages and opportunities are there in the UK to help um, with funding? So first of all, the UK is, is extremely tax friendly for, for startups and scale ups. And there are various uh, further tax advantages and, and schemes available to create tech businesses. Um, so, so firstly, for, for qualifying companies, there are the, there are the uh, ever popular SEIS and EIS schemes, yeah. uh, so seed enterprise uh, scheme to start with. So the SEIS schemes, companies can receive um, 150,000 of investment, uh, which offers uh, investors up to 50 up to 50 income 50 percent income tax relief for any investments made. Um, then there's the EIS scheme where companies can receive up to 5 million uh, a year and up to 12 million or more in a company's lifetime and um, if the com company is knowledge int intensive which offer investors 30 percent income tax relief if conditions are met and then there's a uh, further capital gains tax savings too so um they, these these schemes are very popular for um, attracting investment and encouraging uh people high net worth to, um 
uh, and other investors um, to to make investments in early stage companies, and it, um, so that could, that that provides uh, um, uh, opportunities at the friends and family, angel, and seed rounds in particular. And then there's further uh, there's, there's further similar schemes available for, at the at the at the venture capital investment stage as well. Um, the next, uh, the second one I was going to briefly touch on is the, there's, there's a lot of uh, research and development tax credits available. Um, the UK has one of the most attractive R&D tax credits regimes in the world. It, um, it's designed to reward uh, business innovation and boost um, intellectual property uh, across the UK. We find that a lot of small and medium sized businesses are unaware of these schemes uh, and so are missing out on a vital source of funding. Um, businesses can get a tax credit, which allow uh, which allows them to recoup thirty three pence out of every pound of qualifying e expenditure. So, for an early stage tech company that's um, spending a lot of money on uh, on on research and development, then this is extremely valuable. And um, just doing an R and D claim is it, it's probably a lot easier than carrying out a, an equity funding round. So, it enables you to grow a bit further, grow a bit more, prove your metrics, and then do a a, a more full equity funding round. Um, lastly, just on the, the final schemes to touch on, there's various um, tax uh, specific industry tax credits available. There's film and TV, animation, video games relief. Um, I, I think the, the, the key thing is to make sure you to, is to speak to an speak to an advisor and um, and they'll be able to advise, they'll be able to provide a bit of information about what schemes you, you may be may be eligible for. Uh, we're actually holding a couple of additional sessions to this one over the next couple of days. Um, our R&D experts holding a session on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Um, and also our, uh, um, our tax partner, Mike, Mike Hayes, recorded a, a video on tax credits for the creative industry. And you can see both of those through our through our booth on the Collect site. Thanks, Paul. So some really useful um, additional tax credits there that can supplement sort of equity funding or, or debt financing. And just one question for you, Hannah. So, I mean, what, what's important for a business doing or looking to do a Series A? What is it that they need to get right before they even think about going to that stage? Yeah, so we, we, we look for a number of things um, at the stage that we invest. I think to touch on what um, Mahaj Bean's already said is the importance of management teams as these are, you know, the key element of success. Um, so talented entrepreneurs, you know, with the ability to become category leaders who surround themselves with, with great teams. So I think all of those things mentioned are, are a given for any investor, no, no matter what stage they invest in. But in terms of qualifying for Series A and the stage which Edge invests in in particular, what we, we are really looking to see from a business is, is for the business to be able to, to prove product market fit and to have an understanding of the metrics and the which are both appropriate to the business model and which help them prove the case for that they have gained product market fit. So it could be revenue in terms of the metrics or cost of acquiring customers, gross margin, returning customers or growing monthly recurring revenues, um, whatever it might be. You know, one of one of the most common metrics is revenue. You know, you've got a product or service that people are willing to pay for. Um, but we do also consider other metrics to be able to prove that case of product market fit. So to give an example, we invested in one of our portfolio companies wasn't quite at that one million pounds in revenues, which we usually look to see. Um, but they had managed to achieve a million downloads of their consumer facing app, which told us that they had been able to effectively capture the very specific target audience that they were after. So there was huge value in that. And although they didn't, the revenues weren't there, we could really see the value in the product market fit and the fact that they'd been able to capture that audience. Um, so it, we do look at each business on, on a case by case basis. So in a nutshell, what we really look for is, is exceptional management teams um, and evidence of product market fit. Perfect. Thank you very much, Hannah. So um, that wraps up our session. Before we go over to the um, influencer video, just a reminder about the Q&A session. Um, this starts at three o'clock, runs for half an hour, and that's over on stage seven of the, of the Q&A um, 
stages. Um, if for any reason you're unable to join, please do direct um, any questions through the more Kings and Smith booth, um, where we'll also have lots of other goodies, um, useful goodies there for you as well. Um, so now the influencer video um, will run, which will follow this session. Um, they've been selected as one of Crate Tech's top 100 ones to watch. Um, they're an influencer marketing solution with proprietary technology that simplifies the influencer marketing process for both brands and creators worldwide. Um, and last summer, we supported them with completing a Series A raise with Puma Private Equity. And Paul, who worked with them, was absolutely delighted to be able to interview um, their founder, Ben Jeffries, about his and influencer's journey. So um, please go ahead, play the video and hope to see uh, you're back for the Q&A session. Hello everyone. We've been hearing about the investment landscape for creative businesses. So now it's great to be able to hear from one of London's Createx success stories. I had the great pleasure of working with Influencer on their Series A round that they completed with Puma 12 months or so ago. And so we thought it'd be great to hear from its founder, Ben, about their funding journal so far. So Ben, welcome. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, really excited to be part of this Createx session. Um, so I appreciate you having me on. So firstly, Ben, could you tell us a bit more about Influencer? Yeah, of course. Um, so my name's um, Ben Jeffries. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Influencer. Influencer is an influencer marketing solution um, that essentially combines creativity and technology to build meaningful relationships between creators and brands on social media. So essentially we work with a number of brands um, to help get their message and you know help spread awareness about them through creators' audiences. Um, and we've worked with brands from Alibaba to Starbucks to BBC. Um, on worldwide campaigns um, and it's been yeah a, a really really exciting journey so far. Fantastic so I thought it would be great if you could tell us about your, the story behind Influen Influencer and in particular where you got the idea from. I think if I remember rightly uh, the, it was quite an interesting story at the start. Yeah absolutely um, certainly in the early days of um, Influencer um, it was, I guess, quite a, a, an interesting story because it was actually while I was at, at university. Um, and before I actually had um, influencers as a business, I had a clothing company. And I was like, how can I make this clothing company the next big thing? And everyone knows that if celebrities wear your clothes, it can really um, amplify um, the brand awareness and the reach of a brand. Um, and I managed to partner um, with a number of um, Chelsea reserve team footballers. I'm a massive Chelsea football club fan. Um, to wear the clothes, and I was getting a really good sort of buzz about the brand and a really good buzz um, on, on social media about this. Um, and I kind of noticed that the gap in the market where, because I was benefiting as a brand, other brands could benefit from it too. Now, why it was so interesting was because I was seeing such great results as an advertiser. Um, and kind of, I guess you could say, a bit of like a, a Tinder success story here as well. Um, my best friend at the time, a girl called Maddie, actually matched with um, a YouTuber named Casper Lee on Tinder. And they ended up actually going out for about you know, nine months. But while they were going, I was like, Maddie, you have to introduce me to Casper. Um, you know, I really feel like I'm understanding the advertiser side of the influencer spectrum. Meanwhile, Casper clearly understands the creator side of the spectrum. Um, so she set us up for a coffee. She said, look, can't promise anything. It's down to you to see what you can do. We ended up having about three, four hour session, um, just about like, you know, like jumping ideas off each other into how mm -hmm. we see influencer growing and really making influence work. Um, so I suppose you know, what makes us interesting as a company is we have those like two-sided thought processes as two founders within the company where, you know, um, I really care about the advertisers, Casper really cares about the creators and it's the balance between the two which helps us apart. Excellent, so Casper was your first co-investor. Who else invested in you at the start? How did you go about that process and did you get any uh, further investment at the start? Yeah, so I'd say, in, uh, you know, I guess, before our Series A, we kind of had two different types of investment rounds. So we had like a pre-seed investment round, which um, was an investment round on Crowdkeep. Um, mm -hmm. So a bit of one of those um, cliche stories where it was like, we raised a hundred grand in 24 hours. 
when really that's not really how CrowdCube works. It's basically <laughs> spend months in advance getting the actual fundraising so that when it goes live, it's 24 hours. Um, so we had actually had 139 people um, invest through CrowdCube in the first investment round. Um, and we won 152,000 pounds in total. Mm-hmm. And then, um, the next investment round was really when we started bringing in people who were able to offer us advice and be a little bit more of a, you know, a tactical investor. Mm. Um, so that's when we raised five hundred thousand pounds, and that's what we called our seed capital, really. Um, mm-hmm. And the types of investors that we brought on board then were, you know, we had a lawyer, for example, who invested, who was instrumental um, in helping us out in the early days. Um, we had. Um, Someone who um, is kind of known for taking companies from seed to series A as well and offering advice and support also invest there. Um, And we had a number of other investors um, who were able to really, I guess, put us in touch with, you know, clients, creators, and people who were genuinely just able to help influence to grow as a business. And one of the other um, really interesting things about that investment round too is that we also got a number of influencers to also invest in in the round. So obviously having Casper from a creative perspective was great, but we managed to get um, other people like Joshua Peters, Joe Sugg, and all of these sort of um, creators to sort of really build up this kind of story about influencer that we were by creators for creators. Um, mm. Really, really um, exciting for us. For the seed round, it- you were looking for smart money then rather than just people who would put money into the business. A hundred percent. I mean, we actually had a couple of um, term sheets from kind of, I guess you could call them EIS funds or SEIS, well, they would have been EIS funds because it was 500 grand. But yeah, we had, we had a couple of term sheets from EIS funds, but it was kind of like, we don't really need that because it would have been so much more complex and have had so much more control. And especially during the seed round, you don't need that. You need the flexibility to be able to ultimately back yourself um, and back, you know, your team um, to be able to help get it to the next stage. It's only really when, you know, it gets to a stage where the money becomes millions. Um, mm. should, should I personally believe that you then have an institutional investor because they, you know, come with a wealth of experience as well as a wealth of services which help you grow as a business. Great. So in terms of this team of investors that you pulled together, and who invested in the seed round? How did you help? How did they help you get to the Series A? So I'd say it was kind of split into three different groups. So there was the creator group of um, seed investors who helped really get our name out there within the creator community um, by you know just posting about influence naturally, but also actually introducing us to brands that they'd previously worked with, um, and really having creators invest into ourselves as a you know an influencer marketing company um what that showed was a level of authenticity about us as a business so you know other creators were willing to sign up because they'd heard that these creators were involved within the company so that was one group um another group of um investors were a group of kind of silent advisors who were able to connect us with um you know key brands Um, whether that be um, brands within the fashion industry or brands within the betting industry, you know, a a key variety. And that was just because of their own connections within the business world. So those ones were fantastic, obviously, in helping the revenue grow. Um, And then the third group were more, we kind of formed this um, advisory, like, um, board group, I guess you could say, but they they weren't official board, it was more an advisory board where we'd meet on a bi-monthly basis um, and, we treat it as though it was a you know a full on board, and we discuss a few things. Um, so that was the ones where it involved you know the guy who I mentioned who helped take it from seed to series A, the guy um, who was a, a lawyer, someone actually from Facebook as well, um, someone who had experience within market research who had actually sold plenty of companies as well, and that sort of group I guess could you know helped ensure that we were tracking against um, objectives that we'd set and helps, I guess, formalize the business much more and ensure um, we were actually monitoring the right type of KPIs. And I think that's one of the key things as well um, in the early stages is to make sure that, you know, you have the discipline and, you know, um, you have the focus um, to not take your eye off the ball because it's so easy to in a fast growing company and to, you know, 
keep your eye on the ball on the key KPIs, which can help you get to that next level. So how do you find the Series A round overall? You mentioned that it took longer than you maybe expected. Certainly from our perspective as advisors, it can be a bit of a roller coaster, let alone for new founders. Do you have any tips for other founders who are about to undertake one? Absolutely. I mean, 100% use a third party to um, go in the middle of, you know, in, in the middle between yourself um, and the venture capital. I mean, we used, as you said, you guys and you were fantastic. I think, you know, there were multiple times during, you know, negotiations, due diligence processes where really, I don't, I think if there hadn't been a third party in between, you know, you would have, like, you generally get that feeling inside where you're like, I can't do this anymore. Doing our, you know, this is never going to actually complete or anything like that. When you have a third party in between to basically just help support you along that journey and I guess be that balancing act between the two. Um, yeah, it just helps ensure that you can, you know, push forward and, um, and drive forward. And I think, yeah, for me, hands down, just you know, have a third party in between. And you know, some people are a little bit skeptical because you know, third parties work in different ways. Some charge retainers, some charge success fees. But I promise you, it's absolutely worth it. Thanks very much, Ben. It's been great to hear about your journey and how the London Createx scene has helped you nurture and grow your business. Definitely a business that people should keep an eye out, keep an eye on in the future. Further information about how More Keith and Smith helps create tech businesses, access grants, tax credits and finance to help them grow, please visit our booth at Cogex. Our website www.moreks.co.uk or get in touch via email. Want access to more Cogex videos? Subscribe now for free at cogex.co.